we're very pleased to have uh, Mike Kunziger here from the University of Vienna, and he's going to tell us about uh, synthetic versus distributional lower uh, Ricci bounds. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and I also want to thank the organizers of the workshop for inviting me. It's, it's uh, very nice to be here. <clears throat> so what I want to report about here is uh, some recent work with uh, two colleagues of mine, uh, Michael Obergungenberger and James Wickers. And um, the question we were uh, <clears throat> looking at is the following. There are two, I would say, main approaches to, to um, generalizing Ricci curvature bounds to situations uh, of low regularity. There, on the one hand, there is the, the synthetic approach. Um, this is based on optimal transport uh, methods and um, Ricci curvature bounds in that approach are formulated as uh, weak displacement uh, convexity uh, estimates <clears throat> on certain entropy functionals. And that's very general. That doesn't need any kind of differentiable structure. It, it extends to metric measure spaces. And um, it is compatible with pointwise Ricci curvature bounds um, if you are in, in a setting where you can do that. So for C2 manifolds, that just gives the, the classical um, Ricci curvature bounds. And then there is another approach, an older one in a sense, which I would like to call analytic, where you just say, okay, if you're on a manifold and <clears throat> you have a, a metric that is not C2, but has lower regularity, then you can still, uh, in many cases, view the Ricci tensor as a distribution, as a Schwartz distribution. And then you can uh, impose bounds on that distribution as you do in, in distribution theory. I will <clears throat> anyways show this more precisely. So you, you get, you express this via positivity of distributions. Um, and that's a, a quite common approach um, to, to work in this distributional framework, in, especially in, in physics. Um, so what I want to do is I want to, to compare these two approaches for metrics of regularity below C2. So the plan of the talk is as follows. I want to first say a little bit about the distributional framework and uh, the approach we take, which is via regularization. Then I want to say something about the geometry of uh, C11 um, Riemannian metrics. So C11 <clears throat> means um, continuously differentiable metrics such that the derivative is still uh, Lipschitz, but is allowed to be strictly below C2. Um, then I want to say which kind of synthetic lower Ricci curvature bounds we were looking at. And then I want to start the comparison. So go from, from synthetic to distributional that works in C1. And then going the other way around from distributional to synthetic, which is technically more demanding and works in C11 under an additional condition, I will say later on. And then I want to give an outlook at some open problems. So <clears throat> here is the, the distributional framework that's classical, that was <clears throat> done by uh, Gerald Marston long ago, but then also put in a, in a very nice form by Le Floch and Matar a few years ago. So what we are looking at is um, distributions on, on manifolds. So you take the volume bundle on a manifold, and then you look at smooth sections of that volume bundle. And here we allow certain finite differentiability because that will be the framework, especially for k equals one that we will use later on. And then the space of distributions is the dual space of these um, smooth sections, smooth compactly supported sections. And then you can look at distributional tensor fields and either express those also as the dual space of, of uh, the dual bundle, the dual tensor bundle, tensor the volume bundle, or maybe more conveniently, say you'd, you have um, scalar distributions of that order, uh, tensor, um, the classical um, RS tensor fields. And then what is a, what is a connection? Well, that's now a, a map, so linear connection here is a map from smooth vector fields times smooth vector fields into 
uh, distributional vector fields that has the usual uh, properties of, of uh, a connection as you are used to it in the smooth case. And a, a very important special case here are those that take actually take values in L2 log. And uh, if you have an L2 log connection so that you can do certain products conveniently, then you can define a Riemann tensor. You always have to be careful here because pulling indices might, might uh, result in, in problems about multiplying um, distributions, which you have to avoid. Um, and for us, it's, it's, one doesn't need the full um, generality here. So the, the worst we will look at here are C1 metrics. And for those, you indeed have a unique Levi-Civita connection. So having the usual uh, property and uh, uh, the usual properties, oops, that was too, too much. And what, uh, what's important is you can actually really calculate as you would like to. So you can form the Christoffel symbols and you have these local representations of, of the curvature tensor and of the Ricci tensor. Um, but um, you have to be aware that what comes out now, if you start with a C1 metric, your Ricci tensor will be a distribution, but it will be a distribution of order one. So locally, it's always a, a derivative of a continuous function. So that's, that's what, what will help us. Um, so, and <clears throat> as I was already indicating, what we are doing is we, we will uh, work with regularizations. So, first of all, um, as I was also already indicating, what is, a, what is a distributional curvature bound? So first, what is, is non-negativity of a, of a distribution? Well, what you do is you just test it with test objects, in this case, test densities, that are non-negative themselves. And whenever you insert something like that, you get something that is greater or equal zero. So that's, that's the usual way you do it in distribution theory. And once you have that, then you can say what is a lower Ricci curvature bound. So what you do is you insert a smooth vector field. So, and then you say Ricci of xx. So if once you insert that, you end up with a distribution um, and you say it is greater or equal k times g of xx. Um, and you write that in the usual way. So, so that's, that's how you would naturally formulate it in the distributional setting. And um, now concerning regularization, what, what you want to do is basically, if you, if you would be on Rn, what you, want, what you would do is you would take a Friedrich's mollifier and you would do convolution with that. And then you get a family of smooth objects that approximates it. And <clears throat> that looks a bit uh, ugly maybe, but basically what you do is, you just uh, use partitions of unity and plateau functions. You chop everything up into bits. You go into charts. There you do your convolution. So, so the row here is a standard mollifier, um, which I did not even mention here. <laughs> okay, so that's a, so, so row is just a, a non-negative, uh, compactly supported function. Uh, with unit integral and rho epsilon means you scale it. So, <clears throat> so it's, an, it's a delta net <clears throat> and you do, what you do is you, you take your distribution or distributional tensor field of any order, you um, multiply it by some element uh, of your partition of unity, you push it into a chart, there you do the convolution, you pull it up again and here to, to take care of the supports, you, you multiply on the outside with plateau functions. On compact sets for small epsilons, you don't, you don't even need these chi alphas, but to have a well-defined formula, <clears throat> you write it like that. Okay, so what are the properties? The properties are very similar to what you have in, in Rn, on open sets of Rn, if you do convolution a smoothing. So first of all, you, you do get a, a smooth tensor field if you start out with a distributional one, and you have convergence properties that are as good as the object you are smoothing allows. So, um, for example, if, so for, certainly it converges distributionally, but if the T here is better, for example, CK log or in some Sobolev space, then um, it will converge in that space. And <clears throat> since we chose the, the mollifier here to be non-negative, the row, um, that also carries over to the regularizations. If you have a non-negative distribution, then also the, the smoothing will give you something non-negative, a classical smooth function or, yeah. 
Okay, so here is a, a technical tool that, that turned out to be very uh, helpful in this context, namely the Friedrichs lemma. So in its classical standard form, this says the following. If you have a partial differential, a linear partial differential operator of order m, and you take a, a function that is in, in a Sobolev space of order s plus m minus one, I write here, and then you look at the commutator of p and the smoothing operation, rho epsilon star dot, and then you apply it to this, to this u in this Sobolev space, then this, this commutator goes to zero one order better than you would expect. So of course, p is a, a operator of order m. So of course, you, you, you will lose these m orders here, but you lose one order less than you would expect. So, so this commutator actually um, behaves better by one order than you would expect. And there are what I would like to call elementary versions where you, which you can, uh, where you don't need any uh, Sobolev spaces. And here is one, one version that was, um, <clears throat> that, that's the last one in a, in a chain of, of similar results, uh, which was proved by Melanie Graf. Um, if you just um, take a C1 function on Rn and a C0 function, and then you compare first regularizing both of them, then multiplying, or first multiplying and then regularizing, then this goes to zero in C1. So again, this is one better than you would expect. And what this means is, or what this, what this allows one to do is the following. If you, if you take a metric that is not very regular, let's say C1, and then you do convolution, so you smooth it in this way I showed you before, and you call that the resulting object G epsilon, um, and you take two smooth vector fields, then if you first uh, calculate distributionally the, the Ricci tensor and then insert x, y, and then you do the convolution with this um, distribution here, or you first um, do the smoothing of, of the metric itself, then calculate the Ricci tensor of that smooth metric, then this difference goes to zero and it goes to zero one better than you would expect. Because for example, the Ricci tensor here, so this, this object here would be a distribution of order one. So it will converge in the space of distributions of order one to Ricci G X Y, as would this object here, but the difference goes one better. It goes, it goes actually uh, locally uniformly. And similar, if you, if you look at the Ricci tensor and you, you do the smoothing or the Ricci of the smooth one, this goes to zero in C0. And using this, one can show the following. One gets a, a characterization of um, distributional lower Ricci curvature bounds uh, in terms of these regularizations. So if you have a C1 metric, let's say on a compact manifold, then the following are equivalent. First, you have K as a lower bound a lower distributional bound on the on the Ricci curvature. And second, if you if you take any delta greater than zero, then for late enough regularization parameters, so for small enough epsilon, um, this classical smooth Ricci tensor here will have a bound that's only a little bit worse. Yes. So do you have a can you draw us a caricature of the elementary version why why you get this improvement? Is there do you have a picture that goes with that? <laughs> I'm, you, you, you write down the expressions with the integrals and you estimate. No, I, I just thought there might be a, I, <laughs> so, so I, that, that's sort of an analytic answer, but I wondered if there was a geometric answer. I would be hard pressed for, for Melanie, do you have a great intuition on that? No. <laughs> All right. I mean, we knew that this, that, that we knew the Friedrich's lemma from, from let's say pseudo differential operators and so on. And then, and then we just saw that this looks similar. And, and then it's really, I would say elementary, at, but, but at times tedious. You, but I, I, I cannot give you more than. Okay, and I have one more stupid question. So in the elementary version, you wrote C1 of K. So K is a compact set. Or yes, yeah, yeah, this means that always locally, but for us, it will not matter because 
this is somehow a test case. So, so the, this entire endeavor here is, is, is for the Riemannian signature and for compact manifolds because we just wanted to have a first look at it. One can generalize in certain ways, but certainly that convergence is, is just locally. <clears throat> okay. So, um, <clears throat> so that, was, that is one analytic ingredient that, that, is, that is important because now we have, we have a, a, a handle on these distributional bounds in terms of these regularizations we have. And here, we, we, since every G epsilon is a smooth metric, we know that for, for these objects here, <clears throat> everything is, is in, in every approach, you get the same thing. So if you do synthetic curvature bounds here, these are just the classical ones because you have smooth objects. Um, <clears throat> so that's, so, so this Friedrich's lemma uh, game here is, is one ingredient. <clears throat> Another one is that we know um, quite a lot about um, C11 Riemannian metrics. This is due to work by Ettore Minguzzi actually, um, who, has, who has studied this in great detail and showed that again one gets more than one would expect in this regularity. So I want to just uh, mention a few uh, things here. So one, so now you have a C11 Riemannian metric, so no longer C2. So the exponential map will only be Lipschitz. It will no longer be C1. Um, and the question is, what about normal neighborhoods? You want to, you want to locally work in, uh, in normal neighborhoods. So what about the exponential map? Well, one thing you can say is that the exponential map still is a bi-Lipschitz homeomorphism and uh, it has even a strong differential um, at zero, which is the identity. So normally you wouldn't even expect that, that, you, that you can even say that there is a derivative at zero because I mean, it's Lipschitz, so it, it is differentiable almost everywhere, but at zero, you really know that you have a derivative and in fact, you even have a strong derivative. Um, <clears throat> that, is, that is actually, I think this goes back to Peano this is a stronger notion than differentiability. So, um, and, and there, are, there are also inverse function theorems for, for, for these type of maps. Um, okay, so there are then still geodesically convex neighborhoods. In such neighborhoods, you can express the distance with the, with the norm of the, of the inverse of the exponential map. Uh, shortest curves uh, are still uh, geodesics and therefore just by the geodesic equation are C21. The Gauss lemma still holds. Um, and here is another um, example of a, of, an, of a regularity that is better than you would expect. So if you look at the square distance basically, so if you, if you look at the square of this norm and write it like that, so that function uh, you would expect since this x to the minus one is just Lipschitz, you would expect this to be just Lipschitz, but in fact, it's C11. So it's one better than you would expect. And the derivative you can write down with the position vector field. Um, okay, so, uh, and moreover, the, the um, let, one can also call this the exponential map. So, so you, you now also let the, the foot point uh, be variable, so y comma w goes to y x y w. This is strongly differentiable over the zero section of the tangent bundle with invertible differential. So these are these are very nice results due to Minguzzi, and they they will help us here. Um, and uh, the cost function, if you take the the square distance half, this is super differentiable almost everywhere. Okay, so knowing this. Uh, one can look at optimal transport on C1 for C11 Riemannian uh, metrics. And basically what one can do is one can take uh, the paper, the fundamental paper of Robert from, from 01 and <clears throat> one has all the tools now to, to, to really show that all of the results in that paper carry over actually to C11. Um, uh, Riemannian metrics. So <clears throat> you take, so if you have a compact uh, manifold, you have a C11 metric, you have two uh, probability measures, first of which is absolutely continuous with respect to the volume measure, and you take this cost function, the square distance basically, then the unique solution to the Cantorowicz problem is 
of this Monge form here um, <clears throat> and um, the, the, the map under which you push forward is of this exponential form here. So x of minus gradient of psi, <clears throat> where psi equals psi cc, where this c here is the infimal convolution. <clears throat> so that, that was, as I said, um, proven for C2 by, by Robert. And um, we can just basically go through the proofs, use the results from before, and, and really get that here as well. And then you can define the Wasserstein distance <clears throat> in the usual way. And you can then interpret um, these results by saying that you have existence and uniqueness of geodesics um, between mu and mu. Namely, what do they look like push forward under such maps where the psi is a function like this. Okay, so, so that's, that's uh, a background we will need uh, several times. Okay, so what's the setup of of uh, synthetic Ricci curvature bounds we will use. So um, here is the definition of, of weak K convexity. So if you have a general metric space and a function F, um, then you say it is weakly K convex if for any two points there exists a, a geodesic from X to Y, such that you have along this uh, geodesic, you have this a K convexity condition. And um, then you can define an entropy functional. So you take a metric measure space, you take a, a, a measure mu, which um, so has, a, has a density rho, and you define uh, an entropy functional, and then you define uh, u nu of mu as, as this uh, integral here, plus this u prime infinity mu s of x, where here you have the Lebesgue decomposition of uh, of mu in terms of an absolutely continuous and a singular part. And um, <clears throat> well, I guess either you, you have seen this or, or it's too fast anyways, but I, I guess uh, a lot of you have seen that. So anyways, what, what you do is um, uh, you, you define an, an entropy functional and then, and then you, you, you give the following definition. So we, we follow um, here the approach of, of Lot and Villani to, for, for definiteness. One, one could do, try other things as well, and I will say more about that later on. So you, the definition is, um, you say that um, if, you, if you have such a metric measure space, and uh, then you say that the infinity Ricci uh, is bounded below by k, if for all u in this class of functions. So maybe I should go back here. So, so you take, you take uh, this class DC infinity. Um, these are functions such that you have convexity uh, of, of this uh, expression here. Um, and you want any u nu that I wrote down to be weakly lambda k convex, where the lambda is calculated from the properties of, of, your, um, of your u. Um, like, like here. So that's the lambda k of u. Um, yeah, so, so you express a lower Ricci curvature bound by uh, a convexity property of a certain entropy functional. And what you can then show is that uh, the Ricci curvature is bounded in this, uh, in this synthetic sense, if and only if uh, it, it is bounded below uh, classically if the metric you start with is C2. So for C2, you have, you have uh, equivalence of this, of this synthetic notion and the classical pointwise condition. Okay, so here's the first result. Um, if your metric is C1 and you have a distributional uh, lower Ricci curvature bound, then you also have this infinity Ricci uh, curvature bound. And the the reasoning here is, is, is rather straightforward. So what we do is we, we do this uh, regularization as before. And then it's, it's quite easy to see that these, if, you, if you take this regularized matrix G epsilon and you look at these uh, metric measure spaces here, then they converge to the one of uh, corresponding to G in the measured Gromov-Hausdorff sense. 
Um, moreover, it is known that this infinity Ricci bound is stable under measured gromov hausdorff convergence. And so for any delta greater than zero, um, you see that um, since, since you have this, this convergence here, oops, well, ah, <laughs> yeah, here I want it to be. Um, you, you get that, um, first of all, we know from this, from this result I showed you before that uh, we have a characterization of the Ricci curvature bound, namely um, for the, the, of the distributional Ricci curvature bound. So we know this is equivalent to having classical uh, Ricci curvature bounds for the approximating matrix. Um, and classical smooth bounds means is the same as this infinity Ricci bounds by, by that theorem here. So, and, and that is stable under the Gromov Hausdorff, under the measured Gromov Hausdorff convergence. So, what you get is uh, a lower bound of the infinity Ricci by k minus delta for any delta greater than zero. And so, you, you just get what you want. So, that is rather straightforward. Um, the, the other way around is much more tricky. And the, the, the reason is if you, if you look up the compatibility proofs for, for any of these synth approaches like curvature dimension conditions or, or this infinity Ricci bounds uh, we use here, then you see that to prove that this is equivalent for, for smooth metrics, you need to, well, oh, you need to, <laughs> everybody uses everything. So you, you, you really need um, lots of tools from, from standard Riemannian geometry. So you certainly need Jacobi fields, you need estimates on curvature along geodesics, you need normal coordinates, you need the Jacobian determinant of, of the exponential map. You need to estimate curvature quantities along geodesics, which now becomes basically impossible because a, a curve has measure zero and, and um, your even for a C11 metric, your, your Ricci tensor will, or your Ricci curvature will only be L infinity. So it will only be defined almost everywhere. It might not exist along an entire geodesic. So all of these methods do not, um, do not work anymore. And the, the strategy of the proof therefore will be to, to do it via regularization. Because for the G epsilons, if we regularize our metric, we can do whatever we want. And we want to have sufficiently good control over all the, all the let's say, standard um, uh, techniques that we, can, that we can still go to a limit in, in the end. So the proof will be indirect. Um, so we suppose that, um, remember again, this, this characterization of the, of the distributional Ricci curvature bound in terms of these approximations, so that the approximations almost satisfy the bound. So supposing that this is not the case, you would have some delta and a, and a sequence along which this fails, a sequence of, of tangent vectors. And of course, you can suppose those to be convergent because we're in a compact setting here. <clears throat> and then what we want to do is basically construct exceptional Wasserstein geodesics for these approximating metrics show convergence of those to a, to a Wasserstein geodesic of the, of the C1 metric, and then derive a contradiction to the infinity Ricci uh, condition um, that we used as a definition. So, so basically what we do is we, we want to, to, to create a, a dynamic version of, of, the, of the proof of, of Lott and Villani for, for the C2 case. Dynamic in the sense that now we need to always have um, on the radar, the entire uh, approximating sequence. Okay, so let me give you some, some details. So, so here is the, the indirect assumption that we have this uh, sequence of tangent vectors along which the, the um, Ricci bound fails. Um, and we suppose by compactness that these, these vectors converge. So also their foot points converge here. And <clears throat> what you now do is you pick certain uh, functions phi k such that their gk gradient is minus vk and their gk hessian is zero at the point xk. 
those you can just write down in, in local coordinates explicitly. So, so that's uh, always possible to do that. And um, you can also have that these converge to a function phi in a neighborhood of the point x0 where our exceptional vectors converge to, so the foot points. And then you take, well, you give, just give names to the cost functions, so c for, for the square distance uh, cost function in uh, for g and ck for the for the approximating matrix and then what we use is a theorem of of Claudio, uh, which tells you that if you have control so now here you are in the setting of in, in the smooth setting you have a compact Riemannian manifold and you have uh, curvature bounds and then you can say that if you have size restrictions on the gradient and the hessian of a function phi that that only involve these these quantities, the injectivity radius, this sectional curvature bound, and the diameter, then you can say that phi is c concave. So that is a result on on, on c concavity, which which you can really analytically test, and that that was um, uh, crucial for us because what we what we can say is all the quantities here. Um, if we if you start out with a C11 metric, then you can control everything that goes into here uniformly in K in the in the approximating sequence. And so what we can have is that all the phi K are in fact CK concave for this quadratic uh, cost function. And that means that the push forward under the the map FTK here, which you which you get by uh, taking these gradients of the phi k, this in induces an optimal transport. Well, I mean, you have a C11 metric on a compact manifold, so all the curvature quantities are. Okay, C11. You know, yeah, yeah, C1. yeah. C1. Not, not C1. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for C1, we don't. We don't. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> okay, so. So now what you do is you, you, you start transporting. So we start out with some uniform distribution. So we just take a, a characteristic function of some neighborhood of the, of the point where everything converges to. And we, we normalize and um, same for the, for the volume. So, so for, the, for the volume element of every GK. And then we know that these push forwards here are CK optimal transports. So what, what we have here are Wasserstein ge geodesics for these um, GK uh, metrics. And then what you can uh, show because you have uniform control between the distances. So, you, so the, the GK distances are nicely related to the G distance. Um, it is a pretty easy uh, lemma to show that you can extract the subsequence here. So basically, so an Arcela Ascoli argument that that converges in, uh, so that converges to a Wasserstein geodesic for G. So, and we know what these look like because we have that the C11 optimal transport theory of Robert works. So the C21 works for C11 as well. We know what they look like. So uh, the, this, this, uh, so our exceptional sequence here converges to a Wasserstein geodesic of, of G. And that means it must be of the form of a push forward under a map of this kind where the Psi equals the Psi CC. And what we want to do is we have that, um, so let me maybe go back a little. We have this phi case, we have transport under the phi case, so here. We know that we have um, a convergence of the of the corresponding Wasserstein geodesics, and we know what the limit looks like. So, and the phi k here converge to a phi. So, our aim is to relate this psi we get from the general theory of optimal transport now for C11 matrix, and the phi we get as limit of these of these phi k functions. And for that, we, we now use these Minguzzi results about, um, about the exponential map. We, we have um, strong differentiability of this exponential map over the zero section in Tm. So we have a bi Lipschitz property. In fact, even of Ft and Ftk of these maps under which we push forward. <clears throat> and therefore, we can just by um, 
let's say, more or less classical theory, we, we get that the, the push forward under these maps here possess densities with respect to the volume uh, forms. And well, you can write these down, they look like this. And you see that here you have one over determinant of, of DFT. <clears throat> and what we would actually like to see, we would like to have that the, that the limiting uh, function phi, the limit of the phi k and, and the psi are equal. Well, in fact, it would be, will be enough that their gradients are equal. Um, and we would like to do that via dominated convergence. So we certainly need to know something about the determinant of these, of these maps. And that <clears throat> one can do basically by Riccati comparison. And again, what, what helps us here, okay, so here you take a, an, an orthonormal frame, you transport it along a geodesic um, for, for the smooth approximation, the GK. And then um, you, you get a matrix Riccati equation. And here you again have a curvature quantity for the GK. And again, you have uniform control over that. And so when you, then you just do standard Riccati comparison and the fact that G is in C11, you get that the log of the determinant of these maps of, of these Jacobians here is bounded uniformly in K and N, Y and M and T. And here now comes an additional assumption. I don't, don't just need that the, that the um, denominator stays, stays um, away from zero. I actually want to use a dominated convergence. So here we, we say we make an additional assumption. We, we assume that there is a Lebesgue null set on which these derivatives in fact converge uniformly for t, well, I can basically pick the interval here <coughs> by, by um, scaling the vks. <clears throat> but anyways, I, I need this additional convergence assumption, but I will say later on, I guess, or maybe I, I can say now, this is, uh, this certainly is a restriction, but there are lots of examples where this is true. So if, for example, if you think about um, gluing a, a half sphere to a cylinder, and then, then you would get a, a metric that is C11, but not C2, but has, has a, an exceptional set, just a circle at the top, uh, outside of which, for example, it is C2. So that would certainly satisfy this condition. So whenever you glue along lower dimensional submanifolds, for example, that would always um, satisfy this. Okay, so a little bit more about the proof. So <clears throat> what you then get is you get um, convergence of, so you get weak convergence of, of these um, measures here. And they also, so they, they converge to this, um, to, to, the, to the push forward under this uh, map we had before with the psi that is um, C concave. And um, then you get that in fact, the exponential maps must be the same. And since we know that these are by Lipschitz in a, in a neighborhood of the, of the zero section, you can actually uh, get rid of the exponential maps and see that the gradients are equal, at least locally, and that's good enough. So in fact, for, for what follows, we could just, uh, without loss of generality, assume that this limiting function itself is C concave, which means that for any mu zero, you get a Wasserstein geodesic by pushing forward under uh, the map where you have the phi here. Okay, now in, in the setting we are in, in the C11 setting, by, by the generalization of Robert's results, we know that the geodesics are unique. And so you, can, you, you don't need the full class of these DC infinity functions. You can just take one of them, this R log R, in the definition of the infinity Ricci bound. And for that, this lambda k is just k. So you ha really have this k convexity condition. And then the u nu looks like this. We now have, have this density here. And then using this function and defining this c of yt as, well, what you get basically when you insert, when you, when you evaluate this expression here for u equals this r log r. Um, <clears throat> then in a final step, you can then concentrate your, your initial uh, measures around xk. Again, you can do that uh, uniformly in k. 
um, and using that this CK, so where you, where you have GK everywhere here, converges to C, then you get uh, a convexity of, of this function here. So that is like in the classical proof of, of Lot and Villani. It's just that now it works in parallel for all the case simultaneously. And then you do standard comparison arguments and you see that the, the Ricci at these vectors VK, VK can be expressed in terms of this. So that's, that's the, the usual, let's say, final step in the compatibility proof in the smooth case. You just do that now for all case simultaneously. And since you have convexity here, you get this inequality and then you finally get a contradiction to, to the assumption you had before. Okay, so that was a bit technical, I'm afraid, but anyways, <clears throat> so what we get is the following. If you take a compact connected C11 Riemannian manifold and you suppose that you have this synthetic uh, infinity Ricci curvature bound by K and you have this additional convergence condition I was talking about, then you also get a, a distributional lower Ricci curvature bound by the same K. So, yeah, so, so that's, um, X is some, what, where is X even? Ah, <laughs> oh, yes, sorry, so X is M, sorry. <laughs> Standard mistake. Um, <laughs> Yeah. No, no, but we, I mean, <laughs> so this brings me to my, to, to the first open question. Um, um, okay. So this one I already mentioned before that the convergence condition is not, is not, um, I, I think, uh, outrageous, but of course we would, would have liked to avoid it. So there are lots of examples where it is satisfied and that are still strictly below C2. However, can one do without? We don't know. We have, we have doubts though, because we tried very hard and we also tried with other methods and well, but maybe. So here's, there, there is a lot of questions actually open up now. So for one, um, we now have compatibility. It seems that distributional curvature bounds certainly are stronger. I mean, it seems that we proved that for even for, for C1. This, this certainly works in that direction. And in the other direction, we know uh, the result I showed you. Um, so what about lower regularity? So for example, what about C1 matrix and going from synthetic to distributional? Um, does, do, do the theories branch? So does it still give the same results? We, we really don't know. And the, th the thing is, there are lots of tools, as I mentioned before, that are not available anymore and that you can compensate for with these regularization methods, but not perfectly. And um, there is also a caveat, right? For example, for if, if, you, if you look at C1 alpha uh, matrix with, with alpha strictly between zero and one, then terrible things can happen. So there, is, there are uh, uh, classical uh, papers of, of Hartmann and Wintner, and, and there are also Lorentzian versions of that, that show that the, the, the relation you always take for granted between local minimizers and geodesics comes apart completely. So you can have solutions of the geodesic equations that are no longer minimizers. So, so these things that are, that are really taken for granted in, in, the, in the classical, let's say, synthetic approach will no longer work. And of course, if you, if you go below C11, then, then you don't have uniqueness of minimizers or geodesics. So at least technically, it's, it's not, not at all clear that this will work out. It might, but I'm a bit skeptical. So, the question can also be uh, asked whether if you go in regularity below C2, is it still true that the various approaches to syn synthetic uh, Ricci curvature bounds still are equivalent? In C2, you know that these curvature dimension conditions and this, this Lord Villani uh, approach that, that we were using here, that they give the same result. But again, this uses the entire toolkit. Everything, everything that's, that, that, that I've showed you here is, goes into that. So, 
So does this persist or could it be that if you go below C2 that, that these conditions, that these theories branch? Um, um, okay, so the methods I was showing you here, they are actually not confined to Riemannian metrics. In fact, a lot of, of the, especially the regularization techniques um, were actually developed in, the, in, the, in our work on um, lowering the, the regularity of metrics in, in the singularity theorems of, of Penrose and Hawking. So they were actually developed in the Lorentzian setting. So they work just as well there. Um, so that's, that's not, not a restriction actually. If you go in the Lorentzian uh, direction, then of course, there is again a question of uh, what kind of pathologies um, you, you want to allow and how they interact with your synthetic concept. So for example, if you go below Lipschitz with, with, your, with your Lorentzian metric, then you have, uh, again, terrible things happen. You have a causal bubbling. So the, the, the boundary of the, uh, of the light cone might have infinite measure and so on. So that's certainly a question that's um, wide open. And then an, a very interesting question in, in, in my view is the comparison of uh, the synthetic approach to the singularity theorems of, of general relativity by Cavaletti and Montino, which was recently uh, achieved, and these analytic approaches that, that, that our group has, has done over the past 10 years. Uh, where we are, let's say, <laughs> firmly grounded in this, what I would call analytic approach, distributional, whereas here you use the synthetic approach. And there is a, there is a Hawking singularity theorem in this paper of Cavaletti and Mondino, and it is, it is at the moment unclear how this relates to, to, to these. Yeah, so thank you very much. Maybe. Um, questions?